In that poem, or the words of that hymn, was based on a poem written by James Russell Hall. Once to every man and nation, come for a moment to the side. In the truth, uh, in the strife of truth and falsehood, for good, good of evil, for that side. Some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight. Parts of goat upon the left hand and the sheep upon the right. Most of you may recall that passage from Matthew. Grace and peace to you from our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The lyric to this poem, again by Russell Lowell, are timeless. The words challenge each Christian generation. This message is not for the weak, but for the saints who have been willing to resist the cultural deeds and shifts of this world. For the saints, those people who learn to depend on God and on the community of faith. So, on this All Saints Sunday, who are the saints? As I look and see a, sport, a couple of sports fans, uh, you're probably thinking saints, some NFL team down in New Orleans, whose record right now is 4 2. I think. But they changed this past weekend. So who are they? And what is the difference between those people that we hold in high esteem, those heroes, and the saints? What do you think? The Bible calls us to be saints, not heroes. And if you think about it, nowhere in the Bible is the word hero ever mentioned. On the other hand, the word saint is mentioned some 64 times, mostly in the New Testament. The hero stands up, comes forth, and makes everything right. The story centers on the hero, and we need heroes. By contrast, the saint is not necessarily a crucial character in any story. The saint is almost always invisible on the sidelines, because for saints, the story is about God and God's love. The story of a saint is told to celebrate faith, God's faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to God. The communion of the saints is a whole family of God, the living and the dead, those whom we love and have loved, and those who we hurt those who we bound together in Christ by sacrament and by prayer and by praise. Think about that. You are a part of an eternal community, the whole family of God. And look, look around and see who else is part of that family or see who is not part of that family. Those whom we love and those whom we hurt, all of those are bound together in Christ. So why do we have a difficult time believing this? Why can't we accept the abundant love that God has for us? Why is it so hard to see in the world? How can we know if we're even good enough for God? When we celebrate this day, we celebrate to venerate and remember those who have gone before us to heaven, including those who were never formally canonized by the Roman Catholic Church or recognized by any other church. In a sense, our celebration today reminds us that there are many people in this life who are obscure, <coughs> unrecognized, including perhaps many whom we ourselves know in our everyday life, but we do not recognize the things that we do or have done. Every person that we will ever meet has the potential to be a saint, and we should do all we can help them on their way to sainthood. The baptized, those who would follow the teachers of Christ, display their sainthood in a myriad of ways on a daily basis. Not so much with intentionality, but God's people just doing what God's people do. 
Our celebration this year of All Saints Sunday falls just two days before a bitterly partisan election. And as we enter into the early weeks of what may prove to be a stark and difficult winter as this pandemic surged across the nation, in this country where more than 230,000 lives have been lost, it asks us, or it may require us, to think a little bit differently about St. Because I doubt that we know very many of those people, but we know of people who know of people who have been affected by this. So one of the questions that I would have for you as a congregation is, do you aspire to be a saint or a hero? Do you offer bloom or blight? And again, I tell you that we are the saints. The gospel reading for All Saints Sunday the Beatitudes, was not selected by accident. These are spiritual lessons that Jesus teaches us, and they are the roles that the saints have traveled throughout the history of this church. Beatitudes join us together. They are what make us one body. They teach us how to follow the way of Christ and to do unto others. The Beatitudes are a way of life common to all saints and they follow definitely the message of Jesus. In her latest book, Cast, Isabel Wilkerson describes a picture from an era of the Third Reich. The picture was taken somewhere back in 1936 in Hamburg, Germany. Some of you may remember that picture if you're a history buff. And that picture has about 100 shipyard workers standing and they're making this gesture toward the Fuhrer. But up in the right-hand corner of this picture, and this picture is in black and white, so it's very dramatic, there is this one person who is standing there with his hands like this. Little did he know then that there was a bullseye on his chest. For this person did not accept what was being said about the Jews, would not accept the mistreatments and the other violence that was levied toward them for he himself had married a Jewish girl. And later on, they would be put on trial. He was asked to denounce the Jews, including his wife. They let him off the first time, but then they went on to have two children. And both then the parents, the mother and the father, were arrested. And eventually they were killed in a work camp. I wonder this morning, how many of us could stand and resist the temptation to join everybody just for peace and want to train with In this act of bravery, how many of us could stand against the tide or against the ocean? Christ did that. The person's name was August Lansmesser. He did not march. He did not give speeches. He did not bring attention to himself. But he simply refused to go along with what was being done every day. Unlike Dietrich Bonhoeffer, unlike the over 21 million people who have been demonstrating all summer long, unlike some of you, his demonstration of justice, his demonstration of doing what was right, was simply refusing to go along. What did it take again? What would it take for him to live in any year? What would it take for him to live today? What would it take for Jesus Christ to live in this year? In the saints of our lives, what did they do? Endure? Saints know that life is hard and it inundates us with difficulties, pain, struggle, failures. However, Saints also know that God does not abandon his children, not then or now. Father Richard Rohr said that humans love and adore persons and creatures, not because of their concepts or abstract ideas, but humans love each other because we get to know each other. We get to know the saints. The more we love a person and allow their lives to encourage our own, the more we have love and admiration for them. 
Another such example was Odaris Dixon. Her family founded the Lutheran congregation out in Illinois, in fact, the congregation that I was a member of. I was a student pastor there. She grew with the church and the community. She worked for a Jewish family who owned a series of department stores, a chain of department stores. Doris traveled a lot all over the world, but she was a faithful member of Trinity Lutheran Church there. But Doris could be tough. One did not say certain words around Doris. She sat on the second pew closest to the aisle there every Sunday. But when Doris got wind that several members of the congregation were planning to leave because people of color were beginning to attend and join. Dara stood up to an announcement one Sunday morning and said, it's wrong, I'm not going anywhere. I will not go anywhere. And when we preached her obituary, that was what was going on appropriate. Dara Dixon, a 98-pound woman, suffering from lupus disease, said, I am not going anywhere. How many of us can do that? I gather at Christ I hope lots of us can do that. Lots of us. In this morning's gospel passage again, Jesus summons us to a new kind of life, a kingdom of life, the kingdom of God that has come near. Jesus is trying to help us imagine what life looks like when we live according to God's will, God's rule. We recall that Jesus has said, I have come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. He wants you, he wants us, to fulfill our God-given purpose, to walk out the dreams that he's placed in our hearts, to become again who God calls us to be. Perhaps the dominant promise in the scripture passage this morning is that when God is present, we live according to the logic of the kingdom. Not as it seems, but as it should be. Note the list of those blessed, of those blessings that are in this passage. They don't correspond to what we would normally lift up, what we would normally praise. Who would praise the weak person, the humble person? With the promise of these blessings, there are higher challenges. We've already named one. Imagine that Jesus calls many conditions that we seek to avoid. He calls them blessings. In addition, many of us tend to associate blessings largely with material gains and with material things. This is counter-cultural, cultural, as the scripture points out, particularly in our service to others, but also in those dark and difficult elements of life many of those moments and elements we are going through at this time. Finally, Jesus' sermon, this passage, is a word on transformation. We are invited to transform our sense of where God is at work and what God is blessing. God is not primarily in places of strength, but in places where we are vulnerable, amid our grief, alongside those who exercise mercy, and work for righteousness. And in so many other activities, the word considers not just meek, but downright weak and repulsive. God is with that nurse out there in South Dakota who is sitting there holding the hands of the dying, the hands of those whose families cannot be with them. God is with that nurse. The God we know in Jesus always shows up when we least expect and where we least expect God to be. In the feeding trough of a stable, rather than in a jeweled crib, in a palace, among the poor and the destitute, with the rich and the powerful, on the cross with an outlaw, rather than astride a war horse of a conquering hero. God shows up in our acts of sacrifice and mercy, rather than through assertion to will and attempt to collect power and riches. God shows up in the simple act of the everyday saints. God shows up in our small acts of mirror love. What does God's presence mean? 
God promises not so much to remove our grief, but to transform it as we see the resurrected Christ in the promise. Similarly, we feel like small gestures, those small gestures of being merciful, those small uh, gestures that avoid situations of an eye for an eye, but we would still do that. God shows up there. Given where we are just now, and noting that so many of our people are grieving untold losses of loved ones from the virus, from lack of livelihood, so many people are suffering from lack of hope, of confidence, so many people have lost what they have considered their future. Perhaps we can anchor ourselves and our folks both in the invitation and command to live according to God's kingdom. We celebrate that we have a great cloud of witnesses in all who have gone before us, in that faithful and departed, as still as much as the body of Christ we are. I have called you by name, you are mine. I have called each one of you by name. Embrace one another as Christ. When we gather this morning at the Eucharist, we are not just approaching God with the saints who passed home. But we are also approaching God together with all the saints among us, certainly in this congregation today. The theme of spiritual unity and communal life fills our liturgy. And if you were noticing, you did not hear the word I too many times, but you did hear us. You did hear we. You did hear our. In our confessions, you will hear we have not loved one another as Christ has loved us. You will hear we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. You will hear the instances and evidence of community. Unity in Christ is how we will change the world. Unity in Christ is how you have already started to change the world here in Christ our hope. Unity is about relationships, and relationships get messy. They get strained, they get strained. They go through difficult times. They tempt us to give up on our faith community. As you come to the rail this morning, come with an understanding that we all fall short, but we are forgiven. We are loved. There are second and even third or even fourth chances. Come with the understanding that we have done good. For we have tried to love the neighbors as ourselves, we've tried to feed the hungry, we've tried to clothe the naked, to heal the sick, to welcome the stranger. We are not perfect, but God does not require perfection. Know that we cannot drift beyond his love and care. For God stands, as the hymn told us, within the shadow, keeping watch above for his own. What are the acts of saints in your life? Amen.